It's Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers with tips and advice on landscaping and gardening. Here's Fernando Martinez. Yes, okay, I am here. Thank you, and thank you for joining me. I appreciate you each and every week here listening to the show, tuning in, and giving us your feedback. You can always check out our YouTube channel if you miss any of this show or want to hear any of these other radio shows. Just type in Chaparral Pavers on YouTube. Um, today's topic, I want to talk about pruning. Yes, so um, keeping areas open, uh, making sure we know who lives there at your house. <laughs> Is it you or are these plants taking over? Oh my goodness, it's time to prune, time to cut things back. And let them know who's boss here. So, first of all, I want to say there there's does seem to be a hesitation sometimes if we're not sure about something, and if if you have any fear at all about pruning, I want you to just let it go and just get in there and prune. There's really no wrong way to prune. I think um, sometimes we think that we're going to hurt the plant. You know, and it's good to be mindful of things and, and yes, they're living, growing things, but they're there for our pleasure. They're there to allow us to enjoy them. I mean, at the end of the day, plants could really care less. They're there to grow, photosynthesize, as long as they get sun and water and fertilizer of some sort, um, you know, nutrients, even if it's from the birds, if you've never thrown any fertilizer out at all. They're happy to get it and they're happy to grow and bloom and flower. So the only reason to prune is for aesthetics. So again, you know, they, people think that we're doing it for the plants or the plants need to be pruned or when, when am I supposed to, you know, do this or that? It doesn't matter as plants could literally, they would just grow and grow. They get pruned in nature by animals walking by or breaking a branch or a tree falls and, you know, smashes the bush or clears away natural, um, you know, movement of animals that they go on trails, they make, you know, they walk the same ways for feeding or getting water or whatever. So things just kind of naturally get pruned out in nature by animals. For us, we need to go in there and trim them up, make them look good. And the biggest thing I think for the topic today is to open the space and make the space feel usable and friendly and not jungle like, you know, or you're walking around a bush in your front of your sidewalk, like in the front of my house, I have these beautiful gara that I love. And every year, you know, I cut them way back in late fall or late winter, depending on when I get a chance to get to them. And, you know, by midsummer, they're growing out over the, the sidewalk. And I caught my son the other day walking out almost into the grass to walk around them. And I'm thinking, Hey, this is our sidewalk here. These plants are taking over. So, you know, kind of brought the topic to mind for today. And I just want to maybe inspire you when you go home, if you've got a similar situation or something overgrowing, I want to kind of go over all the areas and keep things feeling open and welcoming. And so by cutting that plant back, And I want to get rid of some myths about what time of year you're supposed to prune and this and that. So um, let's start with that. The time of year, I think really it depends on what the plant is, of course. I mean, I guess the real answer is it depends. But for generally speaking, light pruning and just nothing, you know, save the heavy, you know, I'm getting in there with a chainsaw or whatever, you know, large tools are really cutting significant. Uh, amount of the plant, then I think the timing um, is more important and you, and you want to do it, you know, when, for instance, you know, even, even light pruning, if the, if the plant's about to flower, it's got tons of buds on there and it's about to bloom should be obvious. That's not the best time to prune. Even if it is in the way, I guess you could leave it for a few weeks or maybe a month, let it kind of finish flowering and then cut it back because then you'll get new growth and new flowers, but they'll be where you want them cut back away from the sidewalk. So walks to entries, the entry to a home, those areas are extremely important and should feel open and airy. And so I would start there, just really examine 
walk to your home? Is it, is it just feel nice and open and free? Are you rubbing against branches or the tree branches hanging low? Anything on large trees, anything under this lower, closer to the ground than say six feet, which is most humans would be able to walk underneath. I think in my opinion, should be pruned off or kept up and raise that canopy so that you can not feel, you know, claustrophobic or ducking down every time you try to go to the back fence, you know, go ahead and prune. So the timing of it on light pruning, any time, any time of the year, there's no wrong time to do light pruning. It's only when you get to the heavy pruning that you, you really want to think about when you're doing that. So take roses, for instance, you want to wait to do any hard pruning and really cut them back until the fall or late winter. And those kind of, um, a rule of thumb because when it's fall, a lot of the plants have finished blooming roses. They got the rose hips. They're kind of telling you, you really want to respond to what the plant's doing and fruit trees, they start losing all their leaves, the deciduous fruit trees. Um, that's when you do your hard pruning late fall, late winter. You don't want to do hard pruning in the middle of summer. So if you forgot to do your hard pruning and you really want to do it, um, I mean, you technically you could do it, but you know, like I say, there's really no wrong way, but you could lose if you were interested in keeping as much fruit as you want for that season, you know, then wait, could you do light pruning? Yes, absolutely. On anything. So citrus trees, I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit. They don't go deciduous, so they don't lose their leaves in the winter. So you can prune them anytime but they still have a blooming season and they have a fruiting season. So you'll get to know your trees of usually when they're flowering, uh, not a good time to do heavy pruning because you're not going to get very many oranges or lemons or limes or whatever you want because you're going to be cutting off the blooms. So if you forget and you want to do hard pruning and you can wait, wait till late fall, wait till early, uh, late winter. And that's the last time you want to do it because I mean, that's a, latest you want to do it because once it becomes spring and things start setting bud, you know, then it's already too late to do the heavy pruning. But again, pruning is for us. It's for aesthetics. It's because it's the way we want it to look. And it's because we want the space that we want. I was also going to say around lawns too. Sometimes people forget because it's not the walkway or the entry. Um, it feels good walking around, but what about the grass, you know, where the sprinklers are, a lot of times we'll do small planters, three foot, two foot planters along lawns. And then you put a shrub in there. Shrub gets big over time. It starts encroaching in over the grass. It blocks the sprinklers. So that can be another area I want you to look at too and see, is it time to, you know, cut these things back? So now when it comes to pruning itself, the shapes of the plants, how do we go about the shaping of the plants? Okay. So I'm and I know I've said this before here on the show, I'm not a huge fan of the boxes and the balls and this unnatural shapes. Now they have their place if it's a formal garden. So if you have formal, and I don't know very many people that have formal gardens, but um, if you do, then the boxes and the balls and all those rectangles, those kind of shapes can make sense. Hedges, of course, have to be hedged. Um, but why not natural shapes? Why not um, selective pruning, you know? So you go in past where you want the shrub to grow and you take off, you know, six, eight inches a foot in and then you let it grow out to where you want it. So in other words, if you figure it puts on four to six inches of growth a year and you cut back eight inches, you're going to have brand new natural shaped growth and not blocking the walkway. If you trim right along the edge of the walkway and you get any growth at all, you get, you know, six inches of growth. It's going to be over encroaching into the walkway. And sometimes they can, certain plants can grow more and faster than that. So if you find yourself constantly pruning a shrub right by the walk, it's over and over and over again. And every few weeks, it's the wrong plant for that spot. So take it out, get rid of it, transplant it. If you love that plant or you don't want to kill it, plant it somewhere else where it can have the space to grow or give it away, <laughs> whatever you got to do. I've gotten jaded over the years. You know, we've taken out so many shrubs and plants and things that just, or they get woody from being pruned and pruned and pruned. Like how long does a shrub last? You know, you go to the store nursery or you have a plant planted, whatever. 
how long is that going to grow and be there? Especially if it's the wrong plant in the spot and you're pruning it constantly it gets woody and thick and doesn't look good anyway. Time to take it out, get a dwarf version or a compact something. That's how you get low maintenance. Dwarf compact plants and you space them a decent distance away from each other. If it gets three feet wide, put it four or five feet from the next plant. You'll be doing very little pruning. If the plant gets eight feet wide and you put it in a two foot planter, you're going to be pruning, pruning, pruning all the time. And you may not know that it just could have been a, you know, an honest mistake or, and sometimes they even mislead you at the nurseries or they just don't know. And they just want to tell you, Oh yeah, it gets three feet wide. And you're thinking, well, two foot, three feet, that should be fine. Come to find out it gets eight feet, nine feet wide time to take it out and start over. So you're going to save yourself a lot of headache and you're going to make your yard feel more welcoming. And as you come home, it's going to be more enjoyable. So natural shapes, selective pruning, and stay away from the boxing and the, you know, unnatural shapes that in my opinion, just don't look as good unless you're making topiaries and, you know, maybe you want a giraffe or something out in your yard, which is fine, you know, but get a, one of those, they have those wire mesh, um, animal shapes and you can even plant a vine in there and, you know, in topiaries, since I mentioned it, um, we used to use them a lot more, especially in entryways because of that kind of neat kind of formal look, that spiral, you know, or they had the, the, the different kind of Japanese style with the balls and you can kind of keep those, but that's not low maintenance. That's something that needs to be pruned consistently. It's hard to time. I've seen, um, Australian tea trees planted that way and they have a blooming season and they look gorgeous when they're flowering, but it's hard to keep them in their shape. If you let them bloom and then you let the new growth come out and then look shaggy and you've got to cut them back all the time or you get the, also I've seen the shrubs trained on a stem. I call them like, they look like lollipops out in the yard and then they'll put them throughout the yard. I'm not a huge fan of that. I think it's kind of, you know, designed that's kind of past, you know, it's not really in style anymore, but if you have that yard and the yard looks good and you're not going to be re-landscaping, then just keep them in, in that shape and keep them pruned. There's certainly nothing wrong with topiaries or having shapes in and amongst natural shaped natural plants. Not everything has to be shaped like that. So what about camellias? Um, again, kind of not as popular of a plant as it used to be. And I think, um, think about how they bloom and if they get too heavy, sometimes they can, you know, snap the branch and you can help the plants out that way. And that way pruning would be good for the plant, so to speak, because if it was breaking itself and it were too heavy, you could prune that off and lighten it up, especially with trees, long limbs, that it's just kind of growing out. Maybe it's reaching for light and it bears a lot of weight. You can uh, lift the weight. I've actually raised the heads on trees not by pruning so much, but just lifting the weight off at the ends and waiting to see how, how much higher the branch goes up before you cut a big branch off. So always start on the outsides and make small cuts first and see if you can't lift the weight of those branches. And then if it's still not going up, then go ahead and go in there and, and make your large cuts. So it's, you know, it's all subjective and it, and it's case by case. You have to take everything I say with a grain of salt and go by what's in your yard, what the plants look like. And what about vines? So vines can get out of control pretty quick. They're beautiful at first when you plant them when they're young and hopefully you pick, you know, the right kind of vine that doesn't go completely bonkers, you know, like honeysuckle or morning glory or ivy or, you know, something like that. Um, but there's plenty of vines, pink jasmine, the white potato vines, um, there's bower vines can be quite beautiful and they'll go eventually up to 20 feet in any direction if you let them. And so those, and actually they're pretty easy to prune. And once you train them on something, put some wire on the fence or train them to a lattice or something they can crawl on, they'll want to naturally be there, but they're, they'll send the tendrils out to kind of look for something else to climb on and you just go by and just cut those off so that you can kind of trim flat. I wouldn't necessarily consider that formal, even though you were kind of hedging it a little bit, but, um, they can be really decorative on fences. 
Because, I mean, who wants to look at this whole big, long fence anyway? And, um, you know, it's hard sometimes because you, then you kind of trim on the neighbor's side. But just keeping things in check, not waiting so long before you prune in between the prunings is going to help a lot, too. You won't be making really large cuts. You know, as I drive around, I see trees that have been recently pruned, and they have these big, giant, six inch, eight inch, even up to a foot of width of the where they cut the branch off. And I'm thinking to myself, you didn't know it took you that long to figure out that branch was in the wrong spot. You know, I mean, the sooner you cut that branch, the easier it is for the plant to heal. And you can kind of predict, hopefully, where that branch is going to go and cut it. I mean, my opinion, anything over two, three inches is too big and should have been cut you know, the year before or years before. And so try to get in there and catch those, even when the tree is really small. I planted some multi-trunk birch trees, you know, leave them when you first plant, leave them for six weeks, a couple months before you go hacking in on pruning on them, let them get rooted in. But after that, I can tell immediately which ones are going to be in the way or growing into other plants are going to be, you know, too low and just start clipping them out of there that trunk will grow up and form it. You'll never see that, the big old gaping holes, you know, that are, and it's difficult and takes a long time for that tree to heal and have the bark kind of, you know, grow in and eventually it's trying to meet and disease can be, can get in, you know, boring insects now have this big window to get inside the trunk of the tree. So it's not good. So thinking about doing it early, the sooner the better when it comes to trees for sure. Now, if we're talking about disease, you know, maybe you don't like spraying, you're more of an organic type gardener and, or maybe you're somewhere in between like me where you want to keep it minimal, but you also want to keep things in check and have the plants that you have without having a bunch of bugs and disease and fungus and blight and, you know, all things that plants can get. It's just part of gardening. Um, Pruning can actually be an effective way to limit the amount of disease that you have on plants, especially if they look bad anyway. You know, it'd be one thing if there was perfectly healthy growth and you've got aphids on there, you're not gonna trim, you know, for aphids. You're gonna, you can just, aphids, you can probably just hit them with a hose and it'll, the force of the water will just knock them off of there and, you know, you can wash off kind of the stickiness that it, that it comes from that. But if they're loaded with bugs and the leaves are deformed, why leave all that on there and spray? when you could prune most of it off, hose it all down, and then, you know, see what grows out and do you still need to spray? Well, then, yeah, you can spray, but you're also spraying a lot less plant then. Uh, Peach leaf curl. And some of the things like um, the leaf curl that's or fire blight, they can get on roses, it can get on pyracantha, it can get on pear trees. Um, Those types of things, you can actually make it worse by pruning. So I'm just going to tell you, give you a little heads up here that if it's, if it's those types of um, even roses with powdery mildew, whatever, you can spread it by opening the cut, you know, with the wound. So what you, the way you solve that is you take a little bucket and you do one part bleach, three parts water and mix it in there. And then you can dip your pruners in between as you're cutting out disease. It's a little more technical when you're cutting disease out of a plant But look it up online. I know you can handle it. Sterilize your pruners in between the cuts. Put those, that infected growth, into plastic bags and get it out of the area. Rake up all the dead leaves from around the bottom. Sometimes camellias can get that that brown, I don't know what it's called, bud blight or something. But even even the bud blight, when it gets on on the ground and the water splashes, and it can get back up onto the plant. So keep it clean underneath when plants are diseased. And prune some of that stuff out, but again, sterilize your pruners, either use that bleach uh, mix that I'm talking about or something else so that you make sure you're not um, continuing to infect the plant. Okay, so um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, how watering and fertilizing, putting compost down in conjunction with pruning is very important. Remember, you can uh, hear this show or any of our radio shows on our YouTube channel. It's getting pretty big. We've got a lot of shows on there for you. So check it out. Go to Chaparral Pavers on YouTube and um, check out a topic of your choice at any time. We're right there 24-7. We'll be right back on the other side of the break. 
to talk about the water fertilizing and compost in conjunction with the pruning. Okay, see you on the other side. You're listening to Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on California's Central Coast. Here on 1240 AM and 99.5 FM, KSMA. This show is brought to you by Airval Block. Concrete paving stones or pavers are not all created equal. Airval block pavers are created from a dry mix of gravel, sand, cement, and color. With very little water used, they're super strong. They won't crack or fade. And to be an Airval block paver, the gravel and sand come from right here on the Central Coast, supporting our local community. Airval Block is the only local manufacturer of concrete masonry products like pavers, mortarless retaining wall blocks. Airval Block products are high quality for peace of mind, and there are many colors to choose from. And if you're not sure which products you need or how to use them, you will always get expert advice from the staff at Airval Block, products made on the Central Coast for the Central Coast. Visit their fully landscaped outdoor showroom to see the many ways you can use Airval Block products at number one Suburban Road in San Luis Obispo or go online at airvolblock.com. If you're thinking about installing a new paver patio or paver driveway, check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Serving the Central Coast since 2001, Chaparral Pavers will work with you to get it right and complete the job to your specifications, as customer service is king at Chaparral Pavers. Paver driveways are stylish and durable and guaranteed to never crack. If your old concrete driveway or entryway is a hazardous cracking mess, it's time to call Chaparral Pavers. Go to their website, ilovetocomehome.com. You'll find all the information you need. Check out photographs of past installations and reviews from Central Coast residents who have used Chaparral Pavers. And don't forget, all installations are guaranteed for the life of your home. So check out Chaparral Pavers online at ilovetocomehome.com. Chaparral Pavers, they'll make you love to come home. Now, back to Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers on KSMA. And we're back. Okay, welcome, welcome to this edition here of Patio Side Chats. Yes, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And, you know, if you get a chance, uh, support our advertisers for this show, Um, especially Airval Block. They're our main advertiser here. And if you get a chance to go in there, let them know that you heard about them here on the Patio Side Chats with Chaparral. And um, give them a shout out. They're great guys in there. Any questions? Uh, They're happy to answer, and we do a lot of work with them, and we use a lot of their products. They're a great company, so check them out. Um, Okay, so now back to our topic here. We're talking about pruning, opening up your walkways and your entries, cutting things back off the lawns and the sprinklers and making your yard feel nice and open and airy and pruning, you know, throughout the year on light pruning doing all your heavy pruning in the fall, late fall or late winter. And the reason for that is, is because things are finished flowering, things are starting to rest and it's okay to do that hard pruning and not really stimulate growth and let them, you know, kind of rest, especially late winter is kind of like your last chance. You don't want to do it necessarily. I mean, we talk about seasons on the central coast, like we have them, but you know, Christmas sometimes can be a really warm day out of our year. It's interesting. And the plants can be fooled. So if you prune too early, let's say you prune in the hard prune in the middle of summer, you could get a shot of new growth going into fall or late fall or going through the winter. If we do get frost, frost on new growth is not good for the plant. It's spent all that energy trying to grow and bloom and then it gets frost on it or it's the wrong time of year and it's just, it gets confused. So that's, I think would be the only thing really wrong you could do as far as when it comes to pruning everything else, plants could care less or pruning for our own aesthetics. We're pruning for, to see the plants the way we want to see them. Also, they're very forgiving. So if you do prune and you perceive it as a mistake and you don't like the way it looks, it's going to grow back. It's kind of like a bad haircut. <laughs> It'll grow back. You know, one thing I guess I would say is don't take more than one third of the plant away. 
and don't strip it down where there's no leaves at all. I mean, I have cut things back so hard and I've done it myself personally, just cause I, that's what I wanted to do. I was like tired of this thing was huge. I didn't feel like digging it out or putting a new plant in there and I cut it down. You do take a slight chance that the plant might not come back, but in a sense, if you're having to cut that much of it off, it might be a good thing. So, you know, I would say if you really want that plant there and you're concerned about it, take a third off. If it's still too big, wait a few months, then take another third, wait a few months and leave some green leaves so it can actually photosynthesize and, you know, feed it. It needs to have that complete cycle of, you know, growing leaves, the sun hitting the leaves, the, it completes the, the photosynthesis process. If you take every leaf away off of a plant, I, I don't know, it might put it in a shock. And I think maybe that's why sometimes they'll, they'll die. That's not a technical answer. <laughs> that's just a, uh, kind of an educated guess on my part. But anyway, as promised, I wanted to talk about watering and fertilizing and adding composting in conjunction with the pruning. It's super, super important. And again, if, if you take away anything of what I'm saying here, you're really trying to respond with what the plants kind of naturally want to do. So in the late fall and the winter, when they're resting, you know, you kind of, that's when you can do your hard pruning, thin it out and, and let that plant rest. And then when spring comes, you know, it's growing new growth, it's flowering. You're not cutting the flowers off. You're not hard pruning it when it's trying to um, produce new growth and the blooms and the blooms are for our enjoyment. So we want to leave them and let them be. So the main thing I want you to remember too, is after any of these pruning things, you know, events that we're talking about, you want to add water, extra water with a hose, run the drip system for an hour in conjunction with its automatic watering that's already going to come on or add a few minutes on there and wash off all the leaves and the branches, clean up all any dead leaves or anything from the base and put fertilizer down and do what with that plants wanting to do is, is you're stimulating new growth. The fertilizer is going to help that new growth. Putting compost down is going to give it a nice warm layer, hold that moisture in there. It also has fertilizer in it and it will help produce a new growth. So do it and you will have great success and luck with your plants. Thanks for tuning in. That's all the time we have. We'll see you next week. Check out uh, Chaparral Pavers on YouTube and we'll see you next time. This has been Patio Side Chats with Fernando Martinez from Chaparral Pavers. Go to ilovetocomehome.com to find out more or call 805-588-6917. And be sure and tune in next week at this same time for Patio Side Chats here on KSMA.